Jesus and trust you with Jesus. Santa Maria Mater Deo. Brother in Christ, laudato Jesus Christus in secula. This is Timothy Flanders, the Munitive Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome once again to your Monday Morning Man Show, Our Lady of Victory. And I've recorded this because I spent the weekend going to Pittsburgh. And so I just wanted to get this in on this great week that we have as Catholics. We have the Great Feast of Michaelmas, which was yesterday. So I hope you celebrated with a great deal of uh, Satan pinatas and denouncing Satan and celebrating with your kids and your family. So Michaelmas, today is the great feast of St. Jerome, Doctor of the Church. That's going to be the main subject of today's show. So we'll be talking about St. Jerome. And this brings up our Bible reading group that we have. This, our apostolate, our lay apostolate, is supported by a guild. The guild chips in money to help with the cost of the apostolate. And then there's a penance sodality. The penance sodality is the Fellowship of St. Anthony, which is where we offer up extra penances for priests and seminarians. And part of that is our Bible reading group. So we go through the entire Bible every year. This is based on the traditional office of Matins in the Roman Rite and the Benedictine office. The most of the Bible is read throughout the whole year. But in my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible, I created an annual Bible reader based on the Office of Matins because I needed to fill in the gaps as to what was not read and then add the books that are not read as well. And so it's it begins in Advent with Isaiah, and then we added the Book of Wisdom, for example. And then there's a special Christmas and Epiphany Tide. And then it goes all the way through Septuagesima, Lent, Passion Tide, Paschal Tide. And obviously now we're in the time after Pentecost. And right now in the Office of Matins, traditionally in October and November, is when the books of Maccabees are read and also the prophecy of Ezekiel. And so we're just getting to the point where we're going to jump into Ezekiel right here. This is the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. This is the 19th week after Pentecost. And we're going to have Dr. John Bergsma on the show talking about Ezekiel. It's one of the most difficult books in the Holy Scripture. So I'm looking forward to talking with him about that. We read Ezekiel over three weeks, so breaking it out a bit. But at the same time, we're reading through Maccabees. And then the final three weeks is the most apocalyptic time. So reading the, the prophecy of Daniel as well as the Minor Prophets and the Book of the Apocalypse, one of my favorites. So if you want to join our Bible reading group, you do have to take on some penances, some extra penances, and then you also have to chip into the guild reading guild uh, to uh, financially support the, the Apostles. So you can go to meaningofcatholic.com slash register to be a part of that Bible reading group. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk more about um, St. Jerome in just a minute. But first, we have a ton of great saints this week. It's really a, an awesome week. Um, so tomorrow, October 1st, that's the that's the new feast of St. Therese. And then the old feast is on October 3rd. And uh, it, there, I know some trads have a problem with the various feast days being moved around. Um, I, I try to read the Roman martyrology, martyrology every day. And... What's interesting about that is the Mormon Martyrology mentions a lot of different saints multiple times, and that's because there there's all sorts of different commemorations for the saints all the time. You have their what the Roman Martyrology calls their birthday, which is their death day, and then you also have all sorts of other commemorations. And so a lot of times these movements of the different feast days have to do with moving the saint to a different commemoration. Sometimes is it, there is no commemoration. Sometimes it just needs to be moved to a different uh, day that's nearby. Uh, and that also is traditional in the Roman Martyrology. So I don't, I don't think we need to be too, uh, too upset about those particular movements. But so the new feast is on uh, Tuesday and the old feast is on Thursday. But I just want to read a little selection here from Story of a Soul. Uh, I know this is this is one of the most famous books of 
the 20th century. And a, as a Catholic, I came in from Eastern Orthodoxy. And I just never really was much exposed to St. Therese. And um, I so I started reading Story of a Soul for the first time, actually, this year. And I just want to read this initial section, which I really like, which is very profound. And it's very childlike. This is one of the things that St. Therese is named, known for her her childlikeness as she she died very young as well so this is from uh my copy of story of the soul it's just in the first page or so and uh and this comes to something that i've been trying to work on especially this year is the sacrament of the present moment and doing the will of god right here right now and i think that this this teaching from saint therese is very profound in that regard so she says this I had wondered for a long time why God had preferences and why all souls did not receive an equal amount of grace. I was astonished to see how she sh he showered extraordinary favors on saints who had sinned against him, such as St. Paul and St. Augustine. He forced them, as it were, to accept his graces. I was just as astonished when I read the lives of saints to see that our Lord cherished certain favored souls from the cradle to the grave and never allowed any kind of obstacle to check their flight towards him. He bestowed such favors on them that they were unable to tarnish the spotless splendor of their baptismal robe. I also wondered why such vast numbers of poor savages died before they had even heard the name of God. Jesus saw fit to enlighten me about this mystery. He set the book of nature before me, and I saw that all the flowers he had created are lovely. The splendor of the rose and the whiteness of the lily do not rob the little violet of its scent, nor the daisy of its simple charm. I realized that if every tiny flower wanted to be a rose, spring would lose its loveliness and there would be no wildflowers to make the meadows gay. It is just the same in the world of souls, which is the garden of Jesus. He has created the great saints who are like the lilies and the roses, but he has also created much lesser saints and they must be content to be the daisies or the violets, which rejoice his eyes whenever he glances down. Perfection consists in doing his will, in being that which he wants us to be. I also understood that God's love shows itself just as well in the simplest soul, which puts up no resistance to his grace, as it does in the loftiest soul. Indeed, as it is love's nature to humble itself, if all souls were like those of the holy doctors who have illumined the church with the light of their doctrine, it seems that God would not have stooped low enough by entering their hearts. But God has created the baby who knows nothing and can utter only feeble cries. He has created the poor savage with no guide but natural law, and it is it to their heart that he deigns to stoop. They are his wildflowers whose homeliness delights him. By stooping down to them, he manifests his infinite grandeur. The sun shines equally both on cedars and on every tiny flower. In just the same way, God looks after every soul as if it had no equal. All is planned for the good of every soul, exactly as the seasons are so arranged that the humblest daisy blossoms at the appointed time. I find this very profound because it's easy to get discouraged in the spiritual life. It's easy to wish you were something else. I, my spiritual father, my, my priest actually just told me something along these lines recently where he quoted Soren Kierkegaard, who said that all of sin is an act, every sin is an act of despair. It's either despair about what you are not, that you are not God, or it's despair over what you really are. And so either way, we're not accepting who we are, and that's the essence of humility, which is conformity with the truth. And so accepting who you are, doing the will of God right here, right now, in this case, according to my capacity, is this beautiful reality that St. Therese really brings out in this, in this really profound passage in the first few pages of Story of a Soul. So I really love that. And, and I, it also helps us to love other people, to see how every person is infinitely more value and more beautiful than each of these little flowers, but the flowers are the ones that help us to raise our hearts to this reality. So just a, a little uh, gem from St. Therese. I really like that. Um, so then we have the Feast of the Guardian Angels, October 2nd. And I really love what 
uh, Michaela Harrison has put in here, which is a little child with the guardian angel. As we know, um, the, in, in the gospel, our, our Lord says he, he has the stern warning against those who would scandalize these little ones. And then he says, I tell you that their angels always see the face of my heavenly father. And so there's this special connection between children and guardian angels, which is very beautiful. And I wanted to just read this prayer to the guardian angel that is uh, in the Greek rite. Uh, this is um, this is a little, uh, the service of preparation for Holy Communion with Akathis to our Savior in the Theotokos. This was given to me by uh, my friend when I was um, uh, becoming Orthodox. So here's the, here's this, here's what I'm going to read from uh, right here. So this is just, it's a, it's a great little booklet with uh, the Greek prayers, but here's the prayer to the guardian angel. I think this really shows us the power of the guardian angel and all the things that he does for us. Let's pray. In the name of the father and the son of the Holy spirit. Amen. O holy angel attendant of my wretched soul and mine afflicted life. Forsake me not a sinner, neither depart from, from me for mine incontinency. Give no place to the evil demon to subdue me with the oppression of this mortal body. But take me by my wretched and outstretched hand and lead me in the way of salvation. Yea, O holy angel of God, the guardian and protector of my hapless soul and body. Forgive me all things whatsoever wherewith I have troubled thee all the days of my life. And if I have sinned in anything this night. Guide me in this present day, and keep me from every affront of the enemy, lest I anger God by any sin, and intercede with the Lord in my behalf, that it might strengthen me in the fear of him, and make me a worthy servant of his goodness. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I really like that prayer because so it's it's prayed in the morning or the evening, and you can switch that out as to if I have sinned anything this night, guide me in this present day, etc. Um, so I really like this because it, it shows the the angel doing battle to defend your soul against the demons who are coming in to bring evil thoughts and, and whatnot into your life. So it's a really great thing to pray to your guardian angel. I should mention, um, the, here's the, uh, deliverance prayers from father Ripperger. If you have this book and in this, uh, are also contained the auxilium Christian order prayers. And, um, the, one of the one of the prayers mentions the guardian angel. Oh, okay. So number eight, each member must strive to increase his devotion to his guardian angel. So this is one of the things that Father Ripperger recommends for spiritual warfare. So let's move on into the week. We'll get back to St. Jerome, as I said. So we've got St. Jerome, uh, St. Therese Old Feast on Thursday. And then we have St. Francis of Assisi, the great great saint of the church uh he in this depiction he's preaching to the birds and he's got the stigmata we just celebrated the feast of the stigmata uh recently and there was one thing that i wanted to mention here from saint francis what i found to be very profound um and that is this text from his rule so here is his, his the rule of saint francis so going up to um this is uh, the rules for the Friars Minor. So this is chapter four, uh, part 16. And it's interesting. It says this, of those who go among the Saracens and other infidels, because this is one of the most famous thing about the Franciscans is that they were always seeking to go among the Saracens and preach the word of God. And many of them were martyred. This was one of the things that inspired St. Anthony of Padua to become a Franciscan was that he saw Franciscan martyrs being paraded through the streets who have been killed by the Saracens. So St. Francis of Assisi in his original rule actually has a stipulation as to how do we deal with the Saracens, okay? So we're just going to read this section here, which I think is really profound. So chapter 16, or part 16 of, of chapter 4. Of those who go among the Saracens and other infidels, The Lord says, Behold, I send you a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and simple as doves. Wherefore, 
whoever the brothers may wish by divine inspiration to go among the Saracens and other infidels, let them go with the permission of their minister and servant. But let the minister give them leave and not refuse them if he sees that they are fit to be sent. He will be held to render an account to the Lord if in this or in other things he acts indiscreetly. The brothers, however, who go may conduct themselves in two ways spiritually among them. One way is not to make disputes or contentions, but let them be subject to every human creature for God's sake, yet confessing themselves to be Christians. The other way is that when they see it pleasing to God, they announce the word of God, that they may believe in Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the creator of all, our Lord, the Redeemer and Savior of the Son, that they should be baptized and be made Christians, because unless a man be born again of the water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. These and other things which please God, they may say to them, for the Lord says in the gospel, everyone that shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. And he that shall be ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, shall be ashamed when he shall come in his majesty and that of his Father and of the holy angels. And let all the brothers, wherever they may be, remember that they have given themselves and have relinquished their bodies to our Lord Jesus Christ. And for the love of him, they ought to expose themselves to enemies, both visible and invisible. For the Lord says, whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall save it in eternal life. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If, however, they should persecute you in one city, flee to another. Blessed are ye when they shall revile you and persecute you and speak all that is evil against you untruly for my sake. Be glad in that day and rejoice for your reward is great in heaven. I say to you, my friends, be not afraid of them who kill the body and after that have no more that they can do. See that ye are not troubled. In your patience you shall possess your souls. But he that shall persevere unto the end, he shall be saved. End quote. So that's the end of, of this part 16. So I, what I find that find profound about that is St. Francis advises there, there are two different ways. One is sort of this way of gentleness where you can just subject yourself to all the Saracens and not make any disputes or contentions, but just be subject to them, but confess yourselves as Christians. And then the other way is just to boldly announce the word of God and, sub, and sort of rejoice in persecution. And, and clearly all these quotations from our Lord are exhortations to martyrdom. So you can either be subject to the Saracens for God's sake and confess yourself a Christian, this way of gentleness, or you can be bold and you can face martyrdom. Either way, there's two different ways here. So I thought that was kind of profound because in our day we have, uh, you know, the Assisi meetings and all this controversy regarding ecumenism and interfaith dialogue and whatnot. Uh, so there, there does seem to be a way of gentleness in a sense where we're not going to make too many disputes about it. Um, and we're just going to be subject to them. We're going to teach them humility by practicing in it, but we are going to say that we are Christians and we're doing this in the name of Christ. On the other hand, there is this more bold tactic, which is going to create these dissensions and possibly martyrdom. And that's the other way. So there, there are these two ways. So I, I think there, there needs to be a, a balance here with, you know, the evaluation of what is ecumenism, what's the effectiveness here. Uh, we need to do a balance, have a balanced view of that. There is a place, I think, as St. Francis says, for this way of gentleness and subjection where we're not going to make disputes and contentions. But then there is this other way as well. So this, it's a both hand, not an either or. So that's one aspect of St. Francis that I find to be interesting. So. Let's go back to St. Jerome now. So the classic depiction is St. Jerome writing. He's got the lion with him. And he's got a whole bunch of books. He's in his red cardinal outfit. So what I want to do here is just discuss a little bit about St. Jerome uh, from my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible. And... What's interesting about St. Jerome is that uh, St. Jerome, uh, he, one, of the, one of the fascinating thing, things about him is that he learns Hebrew and he looks at the Hebrew manuscripts of his day. And this is where we get the Latin Vulgate. Before St. Jerome, there were various 
versions of the Latin text. So let, let me just read from my book, Introduction to the Holy Bible. So this is on page 132. The value of the Hebrew and the Latin Vulgate. One church father took the time to learn Hebrew from the Jews and study Hebrew manuscripts they were preserving. He accepted the Septuagint and respected its official use by the church, but asserted that using the Hebrew was especially important. This was St. Jerome. What St. Jerome shows us is how the Jews' manuscripts still hold great value for the Holy Bible, even if the transmission was not guided by the Holy Spirit. Jerome's method in translating the Latin Vulgate helps us understand how. Very early on, the Greek text of the Septuagint and the New Testament was translated into Latin. Latin was the other major language of the Roman Empire, used primarily for legal proceedings and such decrees. Thus, it holds a vital role for the translation and was later canonically affirmed by the magisterium, as we shall see. That's at uh, the Council of Trent. But the Latin text, as it was translated and circulated, contained many discrepancies between the manuscripts. In the process of dozens of copiers, differences appeared in the text due to copyist errors or their own commentary added to the text. These versions were known as the Vetus Latina, or the Old Latin. In the time of some Pope St. Damasus, who died in 384, the need was felt to create a standardized version of the Latin text to avoid discrepancies. So this is where he, uh, Pope St. Damasus, commissioned St. Jerome. And one of the things this shows us is that the, the text, there is such a thing as a traditional textual criticism of the Holy Scripture, sifting through these different manuscripts. This is something that became very acute in the 19th century, but uh, it fell on hard times. It, it uh, got, got a little lost because textual criticism nowadays became uh, such a, uh, a sort of a prideful science where all of these textual critics thought that they knew better. It, it got so bad that people were doubting the very words of Christ in the gospel, whether or not they were spoken by Jesus or not. But there is a true and traditional textual criticism where we can sift through these different manuscripts. And in the history of the church, in the history of the Latin Vulgate, there has been these multiple versions of the Latin Vulgate to improve it, to improve its its textual accuracy. Um, so St. Jerome was an expert in Greek and Latin, but he insisted on learning Hebrew and studying the Hebrew texts of his day. But despite the dominance of the Septuagint, Jerome saw great value in the Hebrew text, even when it was transmitted by the Jews. It is important to bear in mind here that the Hebrew texts that he, Jerome used were over 500 years older than the oldest complete Hebrew Masoretic manuscripts we have now. So the Hebrew that St. Jerome relied on, those Hebrew texts are now lost. We have a later Hebrew Masoretic tradition, and then we have the, the other ancient Hebrew tradition that was translated into Greek, which became known as the um, Septuagint. But one of the beautiful things that there's this, there's this great passage that I always like to bring up, uh, Habakkuk 3.18. And this is where St. Jerome took the Hebrew word for Jesus, Yeshua, also salvation, and he put it into his Latin translation. And so this is what it says, Habakkuk 3.18. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in God my Jesus. And what's incredible about this is that the Hebrew scriptures have the holy name of Jesus all over them because the word salvation is constantly being invoked, especially in the Psalms. And it's a very powerful thing that St. Jerome is bringing out because of the Hebrew. So um, that, those are some of the aspects of St. Jerome that we bring out. But now, I, lastly, I want to I bring out um, this, this powerful wisdom, and that is contained in some of St. Jerome's commentaries on the book of Genesis. And for this, I want to uh, promote this important text published by Emmaus Academic St. Paul Center, and that is the translation of the Glossa Ordinario. This is the great medieval commentary on the sacred scriptures. And so this is, if you're reading St. Thomas, the Summa, 
he will often quote a gloss. He'll say, a gloss says this. And this is referring to this glossa ordinaria. So this is this great commentary. It was a collection of patristic commentaries on the Holy Scripture. And uh, St. Jero- or St. Paul Center is translating this from the Latin into the English, and it's also publishing it in a beautiful volume. And so let me show you what the text looks like, because it's, it's, it's really quite beautiful. So as you can see, this is, this is Genesis 22, and I'm going to talk about why that's so important. So you have the, the actual text of Genesis in the, in the front here, or in the middle, and this is what the actual uh, glossa looked like. There was, a, there was a middle text of the actual text of the scripture, and there's an interlinear gloss that explains certain things. And then on, on the columns here, you have the com- patristic commentaries. And uh, I think that this contained a, a actual picture of, um, okay, yeah, here. So if you take a look here, so this is what the, the glossa looked like. So they're just like re- reproducing what the glossa actually looked like to somebody like St. Thomas Aquinas. So you have this very thing in this text from uh, St. Paul Center. So it's really, it's really an amazing thing that they have done uh, to, to uh, publish this in English. Uh, it, it is going to cost you. It's, it's an expensive volume, but it's it completely worth it, especially for those who want to um, study the Holy Scripture and this gloss and why it's so important. And the book of Genesis is, is very much... Uh, it's in many ways, it's, it's, I mean, it's the most foundational t- book of the Bible for many, many different reasons, but you'll see in the epistles of St. Paul, he's referencing Genesis in many different ways, looking at Genesis and these fundamental things. And the fundamental chapter of Genesis is Genesis 22, the Akida, and this is the binding of Isaac. So when Abraham offers Isaac and this to this day, Genesis 22 is read every single day by Orthodox Jews. So they read Genesis 22. And when you look at the Christian reading of Genesis 22, you see really how powerful it really is. And so we're just going to read some of the commentary from St. Jerome here to honor St. Jerome, read from St. Jerome. Uh, Jane Jerome's commentary. So Genesis 22, chapter one, after these things, God tempted Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham. And he answered, here I am. He said to him, take thy son, Isaac, whom thou lovest and go into the land of vision. And thou there thou shalt offer him for a Holocaust upon one of the mountains, which I will show thee. So here's the commentary from St. Jerome, go into the land, St. Jerome. The Hebrews say this is the mountain upon which the temple was later built on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Hence, it is said in Paralipomenon, a.k.a. Second Chronicles. They began to build the temple in the second month, in the second day of the month, on Mount Moria. The word Moria means illuminating and shining because the Debir is here. That is the oracle of God. The law and the spirit, which teach men truth and inspire prophecy, are also there. So Mount Moria is a very, very important mountain. So St. Jerome is referencing Hebrew traditions here to help us illuminate the text. He's also going, he's referencing all over the place, the Hebrew uh, words and what they mean. And so Mount Moria is where Abraham offers Isaac. And then it's also where they build the, the temple. And then it's also the Mount of Calvary. So Golgotha. So there's all this correspondence on this very Mount. Continuing on. Uh, his ass, etc. So w- when Abraham, he saddled his ass and took with him two young men. St. Jerome. The ass signifies the irrational folly of the Jews who were unknowingly carrying all the sacraments. On the third day. Jerome, note that from Gerar all the way to Mount Moria, the seat of the temple, would be a journey of three days. 
So, and St. Jerome lived in the Holy Land. One of the things that's great about him, he is, he, he's living in the Holy Land. His commentary is, is living in the Holy Land, which is an important piece. Abraham is said to have arrived there on the third day. Therefore, they are wrong who think Abraham was at that time living near the Oak of Mambre, since the journey from there to Mount Moria is scarcely one day. So he knows the geography that he's dealing with here. And then here's some of the gloss which is, so some of this, the commentary is sort of anonymous. So it's just anonymous wisdom that's been passed down. And here's some of that. The three days travel to the place of sacrifice signifies the three ages before the law from Abraham to Moses, under the law from Moses to John the Baptist, and from then up to the Lord and whatever time remains after. This is the third day of grace, the third age in which the sacrifice of Christ was completed. So that's just some of the commentary uh, in this glossa, which is so powerful and, and, and the beautiful wisdom contained therein. And there's so much more that we could say about Genesis 22. Uh, you can take a look at some of Scott Hahn's commentary, uh, but we will have Dr. Johns Bergsma talking about Ezekiel soon. We're also going to have Scott Hahn in November talking about the new Ignatius study Bible. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, but that's it. That's all we have for today. So hope you have a great week. And let's offer up uh, an Ave, and we'll invoke our lay patrons here at Meaning of Catholic. In nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus Tecum, benedicta tua mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc ut in hora motis nostre, Amen. Our Lady of Victory, pray for us. Mary, Queen of the Home, pray for us. Saint Joseph, Terror of Demons, pray for us. Saint Anthony of the Desert, pray for all clergy and seminarians. In nomine Patris, if you these, but it is Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.